All right, <clears throat> so, so we'll get going today. Um, so, yeah, so for today, we're going to be talking about expansion work. I mean, I guess in this class, that's the only kind of work we'll really consider. There's a lot of different kinds of work that one can do besides just expansion and compression. Um, there's electrical work, um, there's work kind of related with biochemistry and things like that with, with surface tension and, and uh, things of that nature. Um, i trying to remember some other examples, but, but yeah, that, so there's, you know, other types of work that exist in chemistry, but we won't really discuss that, go over it. Um, and we'll just kind of focus on expansion and compression work. Okay. All right. There's a review from the other day, right? We have some process where the surroundings did 50 kilojoules of work on the system, and 30 kilojoules of heat escaped from the system to the surrounding. What is the value of delta U in kilojoules for this process? So we have people saying A, right? And so, <clears throat> right, if we look at this, Okay, the surroundings did 50 kilojoules of work on the system. That means the surroundings is doing work on the system, right? The work is being done by the surroundings. So it is supplying energy to the system, right? If you supply energy to the system, its internal energy should increase. So that should be a positive value, right? So I have a positive 50 kilojoules of work that's been done on my system, right? And then the heat, right, is escaping from the system to the surroundings. So the system is giving off that energy. So the internal energy has to be increasing or decreasing, sorry, right? If it's giving off that heat, so it should have a negative value, right? So I have negative 30 kilojoules of heat, positive 50 kilojoules of work, right? And so my change in internal energy, just the sum of those two things, which is A, right, 20 kilojoules. All right. So the reminder again, right, the, the kind of uh, equation that works all the time, right, is this is infinitesimal change in volume is related with some small work that's done by this minus external pressure here, right? So dW equals minus the external dV. That expression is always valid will always work, and we will use that expression to then find the total work that's done for some total change in volume, okay? All right. <clears throat> so, right, if I want, right, to look at how I get the total work, right, I would just integrate that equation, right? I would just integrate from some initial volume to some final volume, 
minus the external dv, and that should give me the total work that's been done in the type of problem, right? Okay. Note here, right, again, that we always use the external pressure in this equation. Right, and so which um, <clears throat> of these statements is all is or are if there are multiple of them, right? Always true when calculating work, right? When using this equation here to calculate work, right? Is one p the pressure of the gas? Is that always true? Is the gas assumed to be ideal? Is that always true? And is W represents the pressure volume expansion work in this problem. Yeah, so I got a lot of people saying three only, right? So as we just talked in the previous slide, right? P is always the external pressure. Now it could be, as we'll talk about, equal to the internal pressure, but it's not always equal to the internal pressure, right? So. So P is not always the pressure of your gas, right? Which is your internal pressure, the pressure of your system, right? Um, right, we, we made no assumptions about whether or not our gas is ideal or not, okay? Um, and so that's not always true. And then three here, right? W is, right, the pressure volume work, right? The expansion work um, in the system, yeah. So three is the only one that's always true. Okay. One and two might be true, depending on how this expansion and compression is done, but it's not always true. All right. <clears throat> so what is reversible? What, what is a reversible process? What, how do I do something reversibly? Right, reversibility, what, what is that related to? You had to guess at least something based off of the name, right? A reversible process, reversibility. What would that mean to you? So you can go from one thing and then go back to the original thing that started. In the yeah, so right, something that's reversible, a reversal process, right, um, can be brought back to its um, starting point, right? <clears throat> and be in the exact same state, right? Um, and, but, so if I take a gas and I expand it and then compress it back down, okay, I can do that reversibly, but I can also do that irreversibly, right? And I can take my gas and I can increase its volume and then decrease its volume back to where it started, okay? Right, but there, but there's a difference between when it's done reversibly and irreversibly in terms of in both cases I can do that reversibly or irreversibly and it gets back to the same starting point for my gas, but something else is different reversibly versus irreversibly. Something else has changed or hasn't changed. Right. If you have an overall reversible process, um, um, no, you, uh, yeah, you, you have to, the overall process to be reversible has to be done reversibly like the entire time. Yeah. So, right, so, so, right, when we talked about all these things, right, when we first talked about, I had one of the first slides on thermodynamics, right, talked about the system and something else. There's the star system and then there's the, surroundings, right? And so the, for a process to be reversible, it's not just that the system can be brought back to the same starting point, right, in the exact same state, but the surroundings, right? right so this is for both 
system and the surroundings. Okay. Because again, this example of a piston, right? I can take a piston, I can take a gas, and I can expand it and then compress it, right? And I can do that reversibly or irreversibly, okay? And that gas, my system, I can bring back to its original state. But if it's done irreversibly, the surroundings have been changed forever, okay? And, and, and they're no longer the same, okay? Even though I can restore the system back to its original state, right? But if I do it reversibly, then I can bring both the system and the surroundings back to its original state. Yeah. So that, that is a difference between a reversible, irreversible process. Anyone have any other ideas of maybe how I do something reversibly? Right, if you were to think of doing something reversibly versus irreversibly, right? <clears throat> How would you imagine I would do that differently, right? If I try to expand a piston reversibly versus irreversibly, what would be kind of the difference between doing that expansion? You know, what if like, hmm. try to think of it, another example here real quick. Um, Right, if you, I, huh? um, yeah, potentially, um, I'm trying to think of another way to, to think of this. Like if I were to try to like, eh, trying to think of like just something like bending paper or something, right? If I were, if I were to fold bend paper, and I wanted to bring it back to where it was, right? I thought about doing this, right? And, you know, say slowly, if I did it quickly. Uh, yeah, the paper thing's not a great example. I'm trying to think, um, right? If you were to try to change something and you wanted to bring it back to where it started, Right? Would you try to do it carefully or would you try to do it quickly? Right? You try to, you try to do it carefully, right? If I wanted to take something and, and change it and then change it back, right? And put it back where it was, right? You try to do that thing very carefully, very cautiously, very slowly, right? Instead of just doing it very quickly, right? Um, right, and so, and, and, and that's kind of a difference between reversible and irreversible change is for something to be done reversibly, right, you do the change, right, very gradually or slowly, right, um, and in the actual slides it talks about you do like an infinitesimal change, right, you do this, it's just very small change, right? So imagine if I had a piston and I wanted to compress my piston, right? If I wanted to do it irreversibly, I could just drop a heavy weight on top of the piston and the piston will shoot, right? And, and, and it will go down quickly, right? So if I wanted to do something, um, let me share a video here. here. This right, so if I have a piston, right, I want to compress my piston. Right, so I want to compress the piston. If I do it irreversibly, right, I can just take a giant heavy weight, right, and just drop it on top of the piston, and that will cause it to compress, right. But if I want to do this reversibly, right, if I want to do this gently, slowly, okay, right, because in order to do it reversibly, I need to do it very gently, very slowly, so I'm not really perturbing my, my system and the surroundings, right, in some very harsh way, right, what I would do 
So I take a grain of sand and plop it on top of that piston. Then I take another grain of sand and plop it on top. And then another grain of sand and plop it on top, right? And I do one little grain of sand at a time, right? And slowly add the weight to this piston till I eventually compressed it down to the bottom, right? And if I were to do that, right, it'd be a very gentle change, very slow change in my system and my surrounding every time I added just one grain of sand, okay? It'd take a long time to do it, right? Compared to just dropping the weight on, but I would be doing this process of essentially reversibly. Okay. So a reversible change, right, done very gradually, slowly, right? Um, and it maintains, yeah, I didn't think so. Right, it, it, it stays, right, maintains, stays at equilibrium the entire time. Okay. So that is right, this statement here that, that stays at equilibrium, right? Um, that, that is a very key point in a reversible change, right? That, that not only are you doing something, right? The reason why you're doing these infinitesimal changes very slowly, very gradually over a long period of time is so that you can keep the system and surroundings at equilibrium the entire change. And it's only when you do your change, maintaining equilibrium the entire way, are you able to bring the system and surroundings back to its original point. If you do not maintain this equilibrium between your system and your surroundings, then when you do this change, it will be irreversible, okay? Right, and so a reversible change is sort of an idealized case, right? We're, we're, we're never doing a change perfectly, perfectly irreversibly, or sorry, perfectly reversibly, right? So take an infinite amount of time to do this very gradual change, right? Um, and you can get close to it, right? Um, right, you can do this grain of sand example and compress the piston, and you know, and it would be close to a reversible process, right? But it wouldn't be like perfectly reversible. Um, right, <clears throat> but again, so, so for irreversible change, right, it's a type of change to where you are doing something such that you'd be able to bring it back to its original point for both the system and surroundings. And in order to do a change like this, you have to do it very gradually, very slowly, right? Um, and the reason you're doing gradually and slowly is so that you can maintain equilibrium the entire time. During that entire change, of your state, you're always in equilibrium, okay? And so that's kind of the key thing here, is that you're always in equilibrium for a reversible change, okay? Um, and for, um, right, expansion and compression of gas, what type of equilibrium, right, can I be, ref might I be referring to, right? right? What type of equilibrium can people, can you think of, right? There's chemical equilibrium, right? We, we, we talked about that in, in general chemistry and other types of chemistry often, right? What other types of equilibrium? Mechanical equilibrium and there's one more. I talked a little bit about think of heat, temperature, or thermal equilibrium, right? The zeroth law of thermodynamics, right? Thermal equilibrium, right? So, so the temperature is the same in the system of the surroundings, right? And, and specifically with expansion compression, right? We, we often think of this as a me right, mechanical, right, is um, kept during the uh, expansion compression, right? Um, this mechanical equilibrium is, is being maintained during the entire time of expansion and compression. And what does that mean, right? If it, so if I'm in mechanical equilibrium, right? And maintaining this equilibrium, that means what? P equals P external, right? So for a reversible change in state, 
right? Specifically, I'm talking about expansion and compression work. It means that the pressure of your gas equals the external pressure during the entire expansion or compression, okay? Questions about this? All right. All right. So these are the three types of work, right? The the lecture video online kind of talked about how you get these equations, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have case one where I expand against the vacuum. Right, in that case, the external pressure is zero. There's no work done, right? There's nothing pushing against me, right? It'd be like pushing a massless object up a hill, right? It takes no work. Things got no mass, right? It takes no work to push it up a hill because there's no forces pushing against you in order to bring it up to the top of the hill, right? So if I expand now against a constant external pressure, then it's just minus P external delta V. And then if I do a reversible expansion isothermally, right? Um, and actually I forgot a term here, um, right? Then that work is minus NRT ln V final over V initial. Okay. So anyone know what, what other specific thing for special case three here to get that expression for work? I'd assume that was done reversibly, isothermally, and there's one other assumption that needed to be made. Yeah, uh, it needs to be an ideal gas, okay? Uh, and the formatting on this slide, not really enough space between these lines, but whatever, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so case three, right, is I assume I have a reversible isothermal expansion for an ideal gas, okay? <clears throat> that will give you this expression for work of minus NRT ln of V final over V initial. So um, on the Canvas website, there's um, there are two documents that are on there that will eventually be covering what those what 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 are in those documents over the course of the um, class here. All right, thank you. I don't know how audio gets cut off. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but I was just explaining, right, that there, there are two documents on the Canvas website uh, summarize a lot of what we'll be talking about with these different um, thermodynamic quantities like work and heat and enthalpy and so on. One is the table has a list of types of changes versus um, thermodynamic quantities and relevant equations to use to calculate those types of changes, okay? And that's, right, for the first, like, two exams in this class, it's essentially understanding that, like, table. Again, I think it's maybe called, like, thermodynamic changes or something like that, uh, uh, the document on Canvas 
I forget. Um, but essentially, you know, uh, the majority of these first two exams is like, okay, here's some gas that I do something to. Well, how much work was done? What is the enthalpy change? What's the entropy change and all this stuff, right? And so it's identifying, okay, what was done to that gas? Okay, it was expanded reversibly isothermally. Okay, it's an ideal gas. That means calculate work. I got to use this equation, right? It's done against a constant external pressure. That means I got to use this equation, right? So we'll be thinking about this stuff often, right? And we're leading expansions and compressions of gases, right? Um, and then what is the relevant equation to calculate those things, right? Now you could technically derive any of these equations for any problem, right? If you just start with the, um, right, the, the equation given right here or right this kind of expression here, right? You start with this, you could derive um, these three equations yourself if you want to on an exam. But if you don't want to do that, you need to keep in mind when to use these equations in what cases. All right, so let's apply some of this, right? Um, <clears throat> so I got 1.5 moles of an ideal gas expands against 0.8 atmospheres external pressure from 0.8 liters to 2.2 liters. The question is how much work is done by the gas on its surroundings? Okay. A couple of constants and things like that are given. Um, I'm going to do, that's not right. Uh, so for those who are on Zoom and create a breakout room, if you'd like to discuss the problem in that breakout room, you're welcome to go in it. And then I will uh, close the room in a minute and we can go over the problem together. Close this room here and then they pop back out and talk about the problem.
All right. <clears throat> so, right for this problem, I have a common pressure expansion. Right down here. Uh, against 0 0.8 atmospheres from initial volume of 0 0.8 liters. And a final volume of 2.2 liters. And I have 1.5 moles of my gas. Okay. <clears throat> right. And I know the constant pressure expansion. Okay. So I recommend right for these problems that we, we, we talk about and deal with in this class, kind of do something like what I did, right? You can write it in more details and things like that, but write out kind of in your own words, right? Summarizing information that's given in the problem, right? In this problem, I'm told I'm expanding against the constant external pressure. I'm told what that pressure is, told what the initial and final volumes are, and the number of moles, right? So that's summarizing kind of all the information in the problem. Since it's a constant external pressure expansion, I know that that work is going to be equal to minus P external delta V, right? I know this because of that, right? Since it's constant pressure, I know work is minus P external delta V, okay? And so to calculate the work, I just got to plug in, right? Minus 0 0.8 times 2.2 .2 minus 0 0.8, okay? Which is minus 0 0.8 times uh, 1.4. Um, which is minus two, so is that 11 or 1.12? No, yeah, it is okay. 1.12. All right, all right, 1.12 of me. That work to go to minus 1.12. Okay, but no, I didn't write down units here, but just remember that this is atmospheres times liters is what you just did. Okay. Um, right. And so I, I'll, I'll get to the question, Ricardo, in just one second. Okay. So this is a common thing with constant pressure expansion problems. Okay where you calculate the work by calculating minus P external delta V and you get the work in terms of liters atmospheres here. And then people just leave it or often what they'll do is they'll put, oh, it's 1.12 joules or kilojoules or something like that. And just assume that's units, but that is not what the units are, right? You multiplied atmospheres with liters. So you need to convert that to joules. Um, in the problem that conversion was given, right? So you get the work in terms of joules, it's minus 1.12 times 101.325, okay? And then that gives me my final work in joules, which is gonna be close to 100 and something. Um, yeah, minus 100 something point something. Yeah. 113.5, thank you. That is the answer in joules. Okay. All right. So there's a question here, can you explain the constant pressure expansion part again, right? Yeah, so in the problem, we were told, here, let me let me just share that screen just so we can see, right? We're told the ideal gas expands against 0.8 atmospheres external pressure, okay? Right, in the problem, it doesn't necessarily say it expands against a constant external pressure, right? But, right, it's telling you it expands against an external pressure of 0.8 atmospheres, right? And that is implying a constant external pressure, okay? So, so we need to kind of, in some of these problems, you have to think about what's going on, right? To, to make sure, right, that, okay, this external pressure is in fact constant, okay? Um, right, 
Uh, but often, right, if it's expanding against uh, an external pressure, right, typically that external pressure is going to be constant, right? Um, if it's not, it's going to be done reversibly, right? And a reversible expansion or something like that, in which case the external pressure is not constant, right? Because then the external pressure equals the internal pressure. Those things are changing, okay? But typically, if you're expanding against a external pressure, right, that external pressure is not changing, so you're expanding against a constant external pressure. Okay? And so because we're expanding against this external pressure, which is 0.8 atmospheres and not changing, I know it's a constant external pressure expansion, and if I know it's a constant external pressure expansion, then I know that my work is just minus P external delta V. Okay? That was that case two in, in, in the previous slide, right? And then from there, I just plug in to get the final value. Okay. Any other questions about this example? So the mold had potential really matter in it. Because as soon as I saw that and I drove past, I thought it was the very first uh, Yep. And that will be yeah. that will be a common thing in some of these problems where sometimes you'll get some information that is not needed. Or maybe you could use that information in some way to get to the answer, right? But there's other ways you could get it where you don't need that information. So some of the, a, lot, a number of these problems with expansions and compressions of gases, right? Sometimes there's going to be at times information given that might not be needed, okay? Um, and so don't, right? And so that's why, right? It's good to write out what's given but don't use what's given to necessarily determine what equation to use, right? We need to think about what's done in the problem to determine what equation needs to be used, right? Because um, again, right, in lab, right, if I were to do this stuff in lab, right, I would potentially have a lot of this information. I'd even have the temperature and other things like that available to me in lab, right? And, and so, right, in lab, what I measure and what I'm, you know, I measure the amount of moles, I measure the volume, I measure the pressure of my lab, right? I measure the temperature of my lab, right? And I measure all these things, right? Knowing all those things doesn't necessarily tell me what equation I need to use to figure out how much work was done in lab, right? I need to think about how I did that expansion, right? And that will tell me about how I can calculate the work that's being done, right? And so, yeah. And that's, and, and we're going through these problems right now and you might think, okay, this is simple, this is easy, right? Taking so much time on some of the stuff, but eventually we'll have a problem like this and it'll be calculate work, calculate heat, calculate enthalpy, calculate internal energy, calculate entropy, calculate, you know, a bunch of different thermodynamic quantities, right? And so it's good to start slowly, start with just a few things we need to calculate to build ourselves up so we don't get necessarily too um, overwhelmed from the get go right, on, on these examples, okay, All right, so kind of the workout example here is on the slide, okay, All right, so quick question here, <clears throat> right, how does the work done for an expansion against a constant external pressure for an ideal gas versus a van der Waals gas compare? Um, I guess I can, I, I should say here, Right, assuming the same changes in volume. Right, let me, let me just add that. All right, so assuming the same change in volume, right, for your ideal gas and your Van der Waals gas, how will that work compare if I'm Standing against the constant external pressure. Will the ideal gas be greater than Van der Waals gas, less than or equal to? Right, so, what is that expression for calculating the amount of work done when I expand against a constant external pressure? Delta. 
right? Minus P external delta V, right? And so in this case, right, P external is going to be the same for both gases and the change in volume, right? I meant wanted to make sure that, that, that I indicated, right, that, that that is the same, okay? So in which case the work is gonna be the exact same between these gases, right? And again, it's, it's because they're expanding against a constant external pressure. If this was done reversibly and isothermally, then it would not be the same because the pressure of a Van der Waals gas and an ideal gas will not be the same at the same volumes, right? With the same number of moles and the same temperature, right? The pressures will differ. And so the work that's done will be different, okay? Um, and, and right, if I didn't add this, assuming the volume change is the same, right? One could potentially argue, right? Well, if the pressure of the ideal gas and the ideal gas is the same, then their volume changes have to be different, and right? And then you know it could be less than or greater than. And, and actually, for the Waals gas, right? We don't know if it would be A or B unless we were told whether or not like um, the compression factor is less than one or greater than one at these given like temperature pressure conditions, right? Because for Van der Waals gas, right, you have a term that's built in for excluded volume, right, which effectively increases the pressure. And then you have a term that's built in for the favorable intermolecular interactions, right, intermolecular forces, and that would decrease your pressure, right? And which one is more dominant depends on the, right, the, the, the kind of the pressure, temperature, volume scenarios of that gas. Okay. So, yeah. Right, but in this case, it's C. They will be equal because we're expanding against the constant external pressure, right? And that constant external pressure just depends on the volume change and the external pressure. It does not matter what the pressure of the gas is during that change in volume. Any questions? All right. So let's calculate the expansion work done by a system when 50 grams of water is electrolyzed <clears throat> against some unspecified constant external pressure at 298.15 Kelvin. The chemical reaction that's relevant is H2O liquid going to H2O gas plus one half O2 gas, right? Then given the ideal gas constants. Think for a minute whether or not you feel like it should be A, zero kilo, B, negative 10, C, negative 407, D, you need more information to solve the problem, or E, none of these. What type of expansion is going on in this problem, right, as this chemical reaction occurs and they form gases? Right, I'm expanding against a constant external pressure, right? So how would I calculate the work for that expansion? Right, minus P external delta V, right? Do we know what P external is? No. Nope, right? So since we don't know what P external is, we need more information to even be able to solve this problem. Um, that we actually could calculate, right? So you can get, in this problem, we're not given the density of water, right? It's roughly one um, gram per milliliter, right? But so in this problem, right, the initial volume is just the initial volume of water, 
which you could approximate to basically be zero if you wanted to for this problem. 50 grams of water, very few milliliters, right? Um, it, it's negligible, negligible small, okay? but I can figure out the final volume um, because I'm told, like, if I knew the pressure, right? If I knew the pressure, I could figure out the final volume because I know how many moles of water I electrolyze. So that means I know how many moles of H2 gas I have and how many moles of O2 gas I have based off our balanced chemical reaction. And so I know the number of moles of gas I have. Okay. I know the temperature. And if I know the pressure, then I could use the ideal gas law to calculate the volume that that gas occupies. And that is my final volume. Right. And so then I could calculate delta V using that. Um, right. But, but in this case, since we don't know the pressure, we can't get the final volume and, you know, we don't know what the external is. So we can't calculate that. Either. Right, we can't calculate for it. So yeah, so more information is required to solve this problem. Okay. So here, <clears throat> I have a gas that satisfies um, a uh, equation of state that's not quite the same as an ideal gas law equation of state, right? It's NR divided by V minus NB, the sort of like a truncated version of the Anderval's equation of state. Okay. And this gas, I have n moles of it expanding isothermally and reversibly at a temperature T from V1 to V2. And the question is, is what is the expression for work given the equation of state? Right, P equals nRT divided by V minus N. So we wanted to get this, right? What we need to solve, right, is this, right? If I'm gonna get the work for that gas, I need to solve this. I know it's done isothermally and reversibly, right? So that means, right, I have a constant temperature and P external equals the pressure of my gas. And I know, right, the pressure of my gas is NRT over V minus NB, right? And so this comes out to be work is equal to minus integral of V1, V2 of NRT over V minus NB, dV, right? NRT is just a constant. So this is work equal minus NRT integral V1, V2 of one over V minus NB, dV, and then this integral comes out to be what? What's the integral of one over x minus two? Or something like that. Natural log x. So it's minus n r t times l n of v minus n b. Then I evaluate this at v one and v two. So work is minus n r t. Um, and I'm just going to kind of simplify this already. It's going to be V2 minus NB divided by V1 minus NB. Okay. I get the different, I get this division here, right, from the fact that ln of X minus ln of Y is the ln of X divided by Y. And okay. just a reminder of where that came from, right? And if, I don't know, like if you learned this notation in math, right? But if I'm doing a definite integral, I'll use this often where I'll do the integral. And then at the end, I'll put this little, you know, line with the, something written at the top and the bottom, basically indicating, okay, this is the integral, but this is a definite integral. So now I need to evaluate it at the final and initial points. And I do final minus initial, right, to get the value of that definite integral. Again, I don't know. If that in calculus taught here or in high school or whatever you learn calculus, right? Um, use that way of doing kind of definite integrals, but that's how I do it. So hopefully it makes some sense, right? All right. So that's the expression for work, which ends up being C here. Minus NRT ln V2 minus NB divided by V1 minus N.
questions? All right. So I have one mole of an ideal gas expands against one atmospheric storm pressure from one liter to three liters. How much work is done by the gas on its surroundings? And what about if it's done reversibly and isothermally at the, at the initial temperature that the gas was at? Um, I guess say Um, I think I have this phrase incorrectly. What I decided to do with the uh, yeah, so I use the final temperature. Okay, that's all right. So let me, I, yeah, that's right. Close that at the final temperature of the gas. All right, let me step back up here. Let's zoom, let me share that screen. All right. So what about it's in reverse isothermally at the final temperature of the gas? Mm. Yeah, this is gonna add something else because it's not very well phrased. Right? Now, technically, you're given all information needed to solve the problem. Sort of made assumptions for the second part that can't be made. All right, um, think of kind of getting to some of the other problems back here. I'm going to, uh, let me actually just share it real quick. 
put down some information, but we're going to start kind of working on this together. Here's Okay, so, right, um, let me show this. right, so this is kind of the information we're given here, ETM, leaders, leaders, mold, right, so if I want to calculate, right, the work done in the first part of this problem where I'm expanding against a constant external pressure, Again, we're told it's a constant external pressure, so it's, or it, it, it's expanding against a constant pressure or an external pressure, right? So minus P external delta V, okay, which is minus one, change in volume is two, and then if I want to convert that to joules, I need, me to, need to multiply that number by 101.325, okay? So the numbers are worked out in the slide, so I'll just go back to the slide real quick just to show the number right. So minus P external delta V, right? So it's minus 202.66. Um, okay. So next in the problem, right? Let me stick here. Right, in the problem, we're told, okay, um, after I corrected it, right, you're told that at three liters it reaches the mechanical equilibrium. So what does that mean at that volume? That once I reach three liters, I'm in mechanical equilibrium, so that means what? What does that tell me about the pressure of my gas at three liters? Uh, it's gone. The external pressure was at one atmosphere, right? So the pressure with one atmosphere at three liters, right, for my volume, okay. Right, and so at three liters, my pressure is one atmosphere. So it means I can calculate the temperature using the ideal gas law, right? Because I am I know the number of moles, I know the pressure and the volume, so I can solve for temperature, right? So temperature is equal to PV over and R, right, is one times three over one times 0 0.08206, okay? Right, and so that will give me the temperature, right, that my gas is at once it finishes expanding, okay, which is equal to 36.6 Kelvin, so a very cold temperature. And that's what you get when you make up numbers for problems. Sometimes you get really weird numbers, but yeah. So, right, so 36.6 Kelvin, okay. And so, right, <clears throat> temperature 36.6 Kelvin. And in the second part of the problem, it says I expand reversibly isothermally with the same volume change at the final temperature, okay. So this T final, okay? And so the work done for reversible isothermal expansion of an ideal gas is minus NRT ln V final or V initial. So in our case, that's minus one. R here, I'm gonna use the 8.314 value of R because that's given in joules per Kelvin mole. So then this will give me my work in joules. So it just makes it a little bit easier. Temperature here, we just worked out 36.6 Kelvin. And then the logarithm of the volumes is three divided by one. So you plug that stuff in and you get minus 334.3 joules. Okay. Yeah. So, so you rounded your temperature up to 37, is that what you said or something? No, I kept it at 36.6. Okay, 5.6. That's fine. I got, yeah, yeah. So, so, right, the question is kind of, right, 
specifically like on homework and exams, right? How kind of rounding and blah, 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 how close to the answer do you need to get? Um, you know, I'm looking like, what, 10% error or something like that. I don't know exactly, right? Like, but um, I, for one, I'm not on significant figures in this class. Okay, it's not um, quantitative analysis or something like that. I, I, so I'm not counting sig figs, um, right? And yeah, depending on where you round in certain types of problems can change the answer by, you know, 5%, maybe even up to 10% or something like that, right? And so, um, right, like it, you got 30, 300 and what? Yeah, 333 point something, right? That's like a 1% difference, right? I'm not, yeah, that, 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 that's not gonna concern me. You'd get full credit or whatever, even if your number's not exactly the same as mine, right? Because again, we're, I, I, uh, I'm i not counting sig figs in my work and I'm not gonna count it in yours. So, um, so where you round will determine, right, your final answer slightly and I'm not worried about that. So, so yeah. If you got your final answer is 400 joules, then probably something went wrong somewhere, and that's most likely not rounding, right? But yeah. Um, okay. Right. And notice here that the work done um, irreversibly is 202 joules, versus the work done reversibly is 334 joules. Okay. And this is always going to be the case where reversible work is always greater than irreversible work. If you want to get the most work out of something, you want to do it reversible, okay? That, that's true for heat engines, for, for your car, or anything like that. If you wanted to get the most work out of the, that combustion reaction in your car, you'd want it to do it reversibly, okay? But at the same time, it's not really ideal to have your engine churning super slowly to get the most work out of a given reaction, right? And so, you know, your car engines are not reversibly done. They're not maximizing the amount of work, right? Their efficiency is not, um, you know, the greatest ever, right? And we'll talk more about efficiency later in the semester. Okay. But, but just note that the reversible work is always greater than the irreversible work. You always get more work out if you do something reversibly than if you do it irreversibly. Okay. All right. Um, Let's do this question next. Okay. This is related with kind of that clicker question where not enough information was given. In this problem, there is enough information given, right? We have 10 grams of CaCO3 heated at 800 degrees Celsius, and that decomposes at that temperature to CaO and CO2 gas, right? I have it in a container <clears throat> with right, with some type of movable piston, right, and outside of that container is an external pressure of one atmosphere. The question is how much work is done during this, this chemical reaction where this thing decomposes, okay, and then the question is, is let's say there is no piston, is no container, right, it's just sitting there in, you know, on the desk and this occurs, right, how much work is done in that situation, right, where it's just open to the atmosphere. We're again assuming the atmosphere is at like one atmosphere. Okay. Right. And again, I'll, I'll do kind of my daily reminder here of watch the lecture videos online, take notes on those things, read over the book, and so on, right? Um, okay. Because again, we'll, we'll overview and review certain concepts in class and, and, and whatnot, and I'll ask you about things you did with the lecture notes um, and such that are online. So please, you know, be prepared with, with you know, watching those and viewing those um, before class. Okay. And I'll get the ones posted for next week, uh, probably sometime today. We'll get, they'll get posted online, right? There's no class on Monday, so. Keep that in mind that we won't meet until Wednesday next week. All right.
So kind of my first question with this problem, what type of an expansion is this? Is this a free expansion? Expansion against a constant external pressure or reversible isothermal expansion? What type of expansion are we dealing with in this problem? Right, we're dealing with a constant external pressure expansion, right? Our external pressure here is equal to one atmosphere, right? And it is constant. Okay. Um, right, I'm dealing with 10 grams of calcium carbonate, right? And that thing decomposes calcium oxide, solid plus CO2 gas. Okay. The temperature here is 800 Kelvin. Right. Oh, Celsius. Thank you so much. It's Celsius. That will make a difference in the answer. Right. So again, this is kind of the information in the problem, right? That's given. Right. I'm, I'm given my mass of calcium carbonate that I'm decomposing. Right. I have my external pressure, right, that I know is constant. My temperature here right, is 800 degrees Celsius, okay. So expansion against a constant external pressure, right, has that work of minus P external delta V, right. And so we know the external pressure, right, the question is, is what is that change in volume, okay. Right, well that change in volume, right, the initial volume is, right, the volume of CaCO3 solid, which is insignificant, negligible, right? Does not matter. Right, you could include it if you knew the density, right, of this solid, okay? And there may be a problem on homework or somewhere, right, where uh, there's something like this, where you're given the density, in which case you could calculate what that initial volume is, right? If you had the density, you could calculate it. But what you'll find in that problem is that it won't make a big difference in your final answer. Right? The question is the final volume, right? That we don't know, but we know, right? Again, we're forming a solid here. Its volume is very insignificant compared to the volume of the gas, right? This is going to be given by the volume of CO2 gas. And so the question is, is what is that volume? Okay. How would I find the volume of a gas typically? The ideal gas law. The ideal gas law, right? PV equals NRT. Okay, temperature we're given, right? We convert that to Kelvin, right? That's 1073 Kelvin, right? So we got temperature, R is constant, right? got pressure, right? Pressure is one atmosphere, okay? Right? So the question is, right, what is the volume, okay? And we know the pressure here is equal to one atmosphere, okay? Right, because imagine you had this reaction, right, going on in a container in a piston, right? Right, let's say that the, the top of that piston is kind of almost resting on your solid, right? As you're forming the gas, right, that piston is moving up as more and more gas is forming, okay? And, and, <clears throat> and, right, like you can sort of almost think of this as if, right, I mean, the pressure inside and outside your piston is always one atmosphere. Um, Right, it's just in this case, the number of moles of your gas is changing as this chemical reaction is occurring. Okay, so it's not right that that isothermal reversible expansion of the gas is assuming no chemical reaction, right? It was assuming N was constant, right? In this case, N is not constant, and so you have this change in number of moles, so like that. So it's not really a, a reversible isothermal expansion with the constant number of moles. Okay, here you have the number of moles changing, but you have this gas that, right, as it's being formed, is um, being formed and expanding against a one atmospheric pressure, and it itself 
is going to have a pressure of one atmospheres as it's pushing this piston up, right? As it's expanding, right? As I'm forming more moles, it keeps on pushing the piston up, right? To accommodate the more volume that that gas has to take up to keep its pressure at one atmosphere, okay? So you are in mechanical equilibrium in this problem, right? Where this piston's allowed to freely move, right? It's just that the change in height of this piston has to do with the change in volume of your gas based off the change in number of moles of your gas, not its change in pressure, okay? Um, again, so, so the pressure of my gas one atmosphere. So the main thing I need is the number of moles, right? Which I can get the number of moles from my molar mass or molecular weight of cal calcium carbonate, right? And then just one to one molar ratio based off of my balanced chemical reaction, okay? So I have 10 grams of CaCO3, okay? And then I divide that by its molar mass, right? It's molecular weight, calcium carbonate. I don't know what that is off the top of my head, but I know I had that on the slide, so I'm gonna grab it on the side here. Uh, yeah, basically 100 grams per mole. Thank you. It's roughly 100 grams per mole. Going back here, right? There it is. All right, so going back here, right? So that gives us roughly n equals 0 0.1 moles, right? So now I can solve for my final volume, which is just going to be 0 0.1 times 0 0.08206 um, times the temperature of 1073 divided by the pressure, which is one atmosphere. Okay. And that volume then comes out to be, yeah. So the final volume is 8.81 liters. Okay. So now I can plug in that final volume right into my minus P external delta V equation, right? Where my initial volume Again, if you knew the density, the, the initial volume is going to be like a couple of milliliters or something like that, right? Like not going to be very large. 10 grams of calcium carbonate is not going to occupy that much space. So maybe you could approximate the initial volume as say like 0.01 liter or something like that. So this would be like 8.8, .8, right? Is the delta V or something like that. But that won't significantly change your answer, um, right? You, maybe you get like 892 joules or something. Not a big deal, okay? We can ignore and neglect that initial volume, okay? But again, so it's external pressure of one atmosphere, change in volume is essentially what the final volume is, 8.81 liters, okay? I then convert that 8.81 liters atmospheres to joules to get minus 893 joules, okay? So if there wasn't this piston, right? And if I just had this open to the air, open to the atmosphere, what would one think the work is? It'd be the same, right? Because if this is open to atmospheres, right? Okay, right, if you think about this solid sitting on your, say, table, right? And there's a solid sitting here on the table, right? As it's forming a gas, right? Well, that gas has to displace other gas molecules, right? As it's expanding and forming, right? So it is pushing against other gas molecules that are at one atmosphere worth of pressure. And it itself takes volume, right? And so it is doing work against the surroundings as that gas is being formed from this chemical reaction. So, so the work will be the exact same, right? Just because there isn't this, say, piston that, you know, is, is sort of helping us visualize this expansion of volume and this um, movement of our surrounding gas molecules, right? Um, that work is still being done, okay, right? That gas still has to expand against the surrounding gas molecules, right? And, and in that expansion, it is doing some amount of work. Okay? And so the work will be the exact same, okay? Questions about this problem? Right. Um, other problem here was just an isothermal reversible expansion, okay, at a temperature of 300 Kelvin from one liter to five liters. 
um, and consider doing this expansion as a non-ideal gas or an ideal gas, right? The non-ideal gas is given by this equation of state where B is 0 0.01 liters per mole, okay? Um, right, we use that work equation that we talked about in a previous question, okay, for this equation of state. You just plug things in and you get the work is, you know, 4,034 joules, right? For an ideal gas, it's just, you know, RT LNV final over V initial, and that gives you 4,014 joules, right? And so you see here that you do more work for this real gas than you do for the ideal gas, okay, in this case, right? And the more work is done by the real gas is because, right, for an ideal gas from one to five liters in this problem, you're, you're expanding, you're changing that volume by like 500%, okay? And if you look at, say, this equation, okay, right, we're taking the LN of the ratio of the volumes, right? And so this 500% change, right, for the real gas is um, less, okay, <clears throat> than that, or sorry, for the ideal gas is less than that for the real gas, which is changing by 504%, okay? So the ratio of 4.99 to 0.99 is 504, right, percent versus ratio of 5 to 1 is, right, 500%, okay? And so you have a greater percentage change in the volume of your container, okay, because some of that container is being occupied by the gas itself for this real gas, okay? Um, and that's why you have a greater amount of work being done for the real gas than the ideal gas, okay? Right, and again, the work is different for these two cases because it's done reversibly. So the pressure of the external pressure and internal pressure are the same. And the internal pressure of this real gas is different from that of the ideal gas. And that is, is changing the work, okay? So you can kind of think of this, so, so this, slide here is just presenting these, why these answers are different and trying to explain it physically in two different ways in terms of thinking of the percent change in the volume of the real gas versus the ideal gas because of the fact that the real gas occupied some amount of volume or you can think of it right in terms of the fact that since it's reversible right the pressure that you're expanding against is different for the real versus the ideal gas okay because the pressures of a real and ideal gas are different and for this real gas, the pressure is always greater than that of the ideal gas, right? Because for your real gas, I just have this excluded volume term, which is always increasing my pressure. So that means I'm expanding against a larger pressure for the real gas than I am the ideal gas. And that's why I get more work, okay? So either, either ways of thinking about this kind of um, lead you to the same conclusion as to why there's more work being done for the real gas versus the hydrogen. Okay. Alright. So <clears throat> that's it for today. Um, on Wednesday, we'll start talking about heat capacity okay, and heat um, and how we calculate heat changes and internal energy changes and things like that. Um, talk some about calorimetry and such, right? Um, and plenty more example problems. So you'll see lots and lots more examples just like this one, okay? Just like the ones we've done today. Uh, we'll just start adding more and more thermodynamic quantities that we're interested in and calculating for these types of changes, okay? All right. So if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them both here and on Zoom. But otherwise, uh, you're able to leave. Uh, I I meant to post that last night, um, but I, I I wasn't able to quite finish it. But there there will be a quiz posted. Um, um, I'll, I'll it'll be due by like um, I guess since we don't have class on Monday, I'll have it due by like Monday night or something. Okay. So um, yeah, usually I'll try to get it up for a little bit earlier. But yeah. All right, so I don't seem to be getting questions over Zoom, so I'm going to end the meeting here and see you guys on Wednesday.